Welcome uh, to all those joining us from wherever you are in the world. It's uh, good to finally be kicking off the gold section of uh, Alta 2020. Of course, thanks to Alan Taylor for the opportunity to present the keynote and of course to Alison for her hard work in getting us here today. Um, I hope at the end of the presentation that for those of you that are unfamiliar with the technology, at least you'll have a high level understanding uh, of the technology of pressure oxidation, as well as an appreciation of its history um, before I address the uh, question posed in the title of the presentation. This slide rather gives the game away um, because my view is that undoubtedly we can and we should uh, make improvements. And I'll do my best to elaborate on what those improvements might be and why we should be making them. We don't have much time, so let's dive straight in. Um, apologies to those who are familiar with the technology. This is very basic stuff, uh, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, POX is a hydrometallurgical pretreatment uh, methodology for refractory gold ores. It could be whole ore, or it could be concentrate. Uh, it uses the heat of reaction from the decomposition of the sulfides that cause the refractory behavior to uh, maintain the operating temperature and pressure. Um, I've indicated some typical feed grades there um, or in terms of a range and uh, concentrates might be typically somewhere halfway between those uh, two extremes. Uh, below 6% um, sulfide sulfur we require uh, heat recovery and that's usually done by recycling uh, flash steam from the autoclave discharge to heat the feed. Um, here's an example of a uh, uh, 70 micron uh, gold grain showing a uh, pyrite grain showing encapsulated gold that might otherwise have a recovery by cyanidation of say less than 10%. Um, often in uh, ores and concentrates that we see, you know, recoveries may be 50, 60, up, even up to 70%, but taking them up to 90% uh, 90 plus uh, after pressure oxidation provides the economic justification for the technology. It could of course be done by fine grinding, but that also has its issues and particularly in terms of the power consumption uh, involved. Uh, these are the very simplistic reactions for the two main hosts that we come across in terms of um, auriferous uh, pyrite or arsena pyrite. The reaction on above is uh, for, for pyrite showing its decomposition through to hematite, um, although it could be to jarosite or basic iron sulfate. And below we have arsena pyrite going through to scorodite, the stable precipitate of ferric arsenate. Uh, the real chemistry is, is, is far more complex um, and uh, I haven't shown the gang mineralogy or chemistry here, um, but this should at least give you an indication of what's going on showing the, the inputs and the outputs. Uh, to summarize the technology, uh, it's very robust, uh, it's highly tolerant of variability in terms of ore type and mineralogy and as a consequence it's well suited to uh, central treatment hubs which might be treating particularly concentrates from different sources. Uh, there's significant flexibility with the operating variables in terms of uh, temperature, pressure and oxygen overpressure which is the function of the two and to a certain extent residence time. Uh, it handles impurities well that would otherwise be problematic for roasting or incur smelter penalties. Um, its high intensity results in a compact layout um, and an overall smaller plant footprint where that's uh, significant. The technology is generally open since the expiration of restrictive patents uh, that were taken out in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, consequently, no royalties are required. Uh, it's not proprietary. And of course, when you're looking at the technology, you have to look at the usual alternatives. So what does a, uh, a POC circuit look like or, or where might it uh, fit in a gold circuit? Um, up at the top left here, we can see the uh, feed preparation uh, circuit, which might be straight comminution or it might be a comminution and 
uh, flotation concentrator, providing the feed to the POX unit operation. The product from that circuit is washed, um, typically in a number of CCD thickness, but it could be by filtration. The solid residue is then neutralized and prepared for uh, cyanidation and gold recovery. The acidic solution is uh, either recycled or neutralized and disposed of uh, in tailings. Um, well, what does a circuit look like physically? Uh, here's an example um, of a recent uh, POC circuit showing the uh, autoclave feed pumps down on the bottom left, uh, the autoclave uh, on the top of the screen with the feed going from uh, right to left. We can see a pair of feed lines, uh, agitators on top of a horizontal uh, cylindrical pressure vessel and discharge lines on the right hand side. Uh, what might this vessel look like on the inside? This doesn't show the agitators, but it's a, a, it's a shot of a, an autoclave um, during the construction phase. The white material we can see in the foreground is the uh, brick lining. There are three layers of brick lining to protect the darker membrane that we can see above, which is the corrosion barrier to protect the carbon steel shell. Um, we can see the partially installed anti-swell baffles and the agitators would be located amongst them. Uh, we also require oxygen, and this is an example of a uh, bulk oxygen, tonnage oxygen plant, a 2000 tonne capacity modern plant, indicating the significant size and scale of operation of uh, modern POC circuits. So having an understanding of the, uh, of the technology uh, in broad terms, let's have a, a quick look at the, the history. Um, I'd refer you to these uh, two papers, which um, uh, I've used in the preparation of, of uh, my paper, that they're, they're both well worth a read. Um, the, the first was produced by an executive of the Ford Motor Corporation in, uh, in 1960 and has a good history of the early um, period of uh, the development of pressure oxidation for, for base metals. And then Mike Collins is uh, from Sherritt's um, paper a couple of years ago as a good overview of the whole history, including uh, gold pressure oxidation. Uh, I've chosen some key milestones in terms of the development of the technology, uh, and that goes to the, um, the invention of the Bayer process. Um, as many of you be aware of um, uh, leaching of uh, bauxite using caustic at uh, pressure and temperature. Uh, then, uh, almost 40 years later, the uh, first patent for the leaching of sulphide minerals in, in 1927, followed shortly after the war by the uh, announcement of the development of the Chemico process uh, for the leaching of base metals. And the significant thing here is that um, there were three plants chosen. One of those was for Sherry Gordon in Alberta, who subsequently took over the technology and developed it, um, as we can, uh, as we'll discuss in a moment. Um, and, and and that takeover took it took place in uh, 1957. Then I think a, a, a key milestone, which started to provide the financial incentive for the development of uh, gold pressure oxidation technology was the dropping of the gold standard by the US in 1971, which ultimately resulted in the uh, commissioning of uh, home stakes, McLaughlin mill and POC circuit with assistance from Sherritt in 1985. I hope you can see this chart clearly. It, uh, it shows the gold price for the last hundred years on the left hand side of the chart we can see the period up to 1971 where the uh, gold standard was in place and effectively uh, no change in gold price. The difference between the brown and the blue lines uh, shows the um, adjustment for the consumer price index or the effect to inflation in other words the buying power of gold in, uh, in the earlier period was significantly higher than it, than it uh, relative to its nominal price um, as shown. 
Um, I've shown the line there showing the, the, the point at which the, the gold standard was uh, dropped in 1971 and we can see the, the gold price start to uh, accelerate immediately. Um, the blue dot um, coincides with the commissioning <coughs> of the uh, McLaughlin Mill in 1985 um, and that red dot shows the unfortunate time in uh, 1990. T9, uh, where gold slipped below 260 US dollars an ounce and it was a painful time for all of us who were in the industry at that time. But since then, uh, obviously there's been a peak in 2011-12, but um, uh, the financial incentive has certainly been there, particularly in uh, non-US dollar terms. Here's a history uh, showing uh, the gold pos box uh, projects that, that have been built. Um, we've got the original owner, many of them have changed hands and it's all too difficult to try and catch up with that. So I'm showing them with the original owner, the name of the property, um, the country in which they were located and their commissioning date, as well as the operating temperature. And we can see that there was a significant number of uh, operations um, in the late eighties, early nineties with a, a wide geographic uh, distribution. Um, things slow down a bit towards the uh, end of the 90s but with uh, several significant operations which are still in operation today. Interestingly the gold strike plant back in uh, 1990 was uh, the operation where the uh, drop leg for autoclave feed pump um, was, was developed and I'll refer to that a, a bit later. Uh, since the new millennium, um, there have been a number of plants built. Uh, there was a bit of a hiatus until uh, Kittler in 2008, but we can see the uh, significant number of plants built since 2012 and the generally increasing uh, uh, operating temperatures of those plants. And obviously we're expecting a couple of new plants to come online sometime next year. This is a, an interesting slide from uh, Mike's paper, which shows the development of the technology. And it has certainly developed over this period of time in terms of the size of the vessels uh, that have been used from the uh, 20 meter autoclave uh, back for the first uh, plant for Sherrick Gordon to the uh, Lahir expansion in two, uh, 2012, um, where the autoclave was almost uh, 48 meters long um, and almost 600 cubic meters in volume. So we're talking about some significant developments. In terms of those developments, uh, you know, relating to the potential for improvements, and one of the things I think that's important, particularly from a West Australian context, uh, is the synergy with uh, HPAL operations. And uh, I've indicated the conditions there, and we can see that HPAL, the technology for uh, acid leaching of nickel, is more forcing, there's no oxygen involved, but uh, the conditions are quite forcing and have been uh, driving the improvement of the physical uh, equipment used for um, pressure oxidation, as well as obviously pressure acid leaching. I'll just run through some of those examples. Um, we can see here, this is an example of a uh, HPL circuit. And the key ingredients there are, are very similar to what we might uh, find in a, in a box circuit. Um, in terms of improvements to the technology, uh, <clears throat> a key constraint in terms of uh, availability operating time has always been the performance of the severe service uh, ball valves, metal seeded ball valves, which are used to isolate the autoclave. On the left, we can see a large 10 inch valve uh, with a uh, pneumatic actuator and spring return. And this thing is a mighty beast when it closes. Um, uh, in the middle, we can see <clears throat> a uh, hydraulic actuator on a similar line size uh, developed for uh, the nickel industry. And consequently, on the right hand side, we can see um, a hydraulic actuator fitted to the, at a later date, of course, uh, fitted in the same location as the. Um, first pneumatic actuator showing a significant reduction in size and 
with also significant operating uh, and maintenance benefits. Uh, not only uh, has the technology moved on to uh, hydraulic actuation, uh, but valve sizes have increased significantly such that uh, 14 inch 600 pound valves are common in the nickel industry as shown here on the left. Um, and the nickel industry has led to the further development of alternatives to uh, the sphere service ball valves, including um, metal seated knife gate valves as uh, shown on the right hand side. Uh, the improvement of valve technology is not just limited to isolation valves, but control valves. And we can see uh, an early example of a uh, pneumatically controlled uh, survivor valve on the, on the left used for autoclave pressure control or um, autoclave level discharge control and uh, more updated uh, versions on the right hand side with integrated hydraulic actuation. Um, there have been certainly uh, improvements to pumps and I refer pump technology and the, these are examples of the, uh, the feed pumps. Um, these ones are in, in uh, HPL service and they um, show the diaphragms and drop legs which are used to isolate the pumps from the hot slurry coming in. I as I alluded to earlier, uh, back in 1990, the development of Getchell, um, Giho designed those pumps for a, an inlet temperature of uh, 155 degrees. Now we're getting to north of 220 degrees, which is a significant improvement and it affects the efficiency, particularly of the thermal efficiency of um, low sulfur for the treatment of low sulfur ores. Um, there's also been uh, developments in, in terms of vessel fabrication. We can see some uh, fairly large um, nickel autoclaves being constructed uh, on the left hand side here and this is the on the right hand side we see the interior these have a uh, titanium cladding as opposed to the the membrane and brick lining that we saw before and this technology has been discussed as an alternative for that uh, a, a cheaper and uh, less maintenance and intensive um, option and that's certainly still being considered today uh, here's an example of a comp the completed vessel. We can see the brick line vessel on the left hand side and the uh, completed uh, uh, titanium cloud autoclave on, on the right hand side without the anti swirl baffles, but including the uh, intercompartment wall, which is missing from the example on the left. That talks to the improvements in terms of synergy. There have been a number of improvements just in terms of overall uh, gold technology. And um, I've highlighted some of them here. And fundamentally, the chemistry has been understood for the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, technology has been developed for the treatment of double refractory ores. That's ores containing carbonaceous material. Uh, operating temperature and pressure has gradually increased. Watercloth sizes have increased, resulting in um, increased uh, oxygen plant sizing. Uh, the technology has also progressed to the point that um, autoclave um, fabrication on site from partially fabricated uh, autoclaves uh, has been established, for example, at uh, Chopper in Turkey. And uh, there's continuing work on ongoing uh, alternative uh, construction materials in terms of the autoclaves, as I've alluded to, and their brick linings. So now to uh, opportunities, where do I see some examples for opportunities? Well, the first three items that I've indicated here are, are, are you might call soft issues, but uh, I think they are critical. Um, safety, uh, safe operation, should I say, provides our operating, our license to, to operate. We, we can't do without it. And certainly, uh, as the operations have demonstrated, uh, safety is OK, but it could certainly be better. And I think that should be our key priority moving forward. And I'll talk about some examples of that. Um, I think we need to focus on a reduction in capex to make uh, the plants more cost effective. Uh, despite the significant increase in the gold price, we need to um, be smarter about how we're designing the plants and, and therefore uh, reduce their capital burden on the overall investment. Um, we need to improve operating time uh, to make sure that the plant is 
running as efficiently as we can. And of course, there'll be a range of technical improvements which will, will just continue. So to put safety in context, um, there are some, some significant potential hazards uh, with pressure oxidation, and I've listed some of them there, and these can't be underestimated. And significant effort goes both in the design uh, phase and uh, in the operations and maintenance phase to managing these. Um, so how do we tackle them? I think we need to be pragmatic. Um, we need to understand what the risks are and apply an appropriate degree of conservatism where required, um, not making the designs overly complex to, to get around issues or not relying on instrumentation. So a real balance um, based on a, a deep and solid understanding of the technology and the risks involved. Um, the second point is, is reasonably common in our industry, but um, you know the use of uh, risk assessment methodologies to really allow us to understand the risk and, and to allocate uh, capital in the right areas to manage that risk using technologies that I'm sure many of you are aware of, like HAZOP, uh, a layer of protection analysis and uh, quantitative risk assessment. And where required, uh, the judicious application of um, uh, safety integrity level loops um, and shutdown systems and that may be uh, a good example might be um, the use of autoclave feed pump control uh, reducing the requirement for uh, pressure relief valve sizing and but that has to be done extremely carefully and and um, and uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't be too many uh, silver rated loops in the whole circuit any more than needs to be, should I say. Um, in terms of operations, uh, uh, we can't underestimate the operator uh, and uh, maintenance uh, training, and um, which is really going to determine uh, how effectively people are running their plants and how, how safely they, they are doing so. Um, and that, that, that's a key component to making sure that that's reinforced and continually improved. Um, keeping uh, an iron management of change uh, because it's so easy for things be in the control system or physically to change and and have un unintended consequences recognizing that there is institutional memory loss and uh, lessons that have been learned often do do get forgotten and we need to make sure that those memories are re retained and uh, passed on to new de generations of operators and maintenance personnel uh, part of that, of course, is open and transparent incident reporting. Uh, and I, in the paper, I give a particular example that we don't have time to address here, but uh, we need for us to learn the lessons of, uh, of previous incidents. We need to ensure that uh, they're properly investigated and reported and hopefully disseminated amongst others in the, in the industry. I think that's a very important thing. Uh, getting to capex, um, the first point may seem obvious, but uh, it's the the rule rather than the exception that when we come to to look look at potential uh, projects, uh, sulphide sulphur hasn't been considered as a constraint, and it's not included in the geological model. So uh, without that, you're you're flying blind or having to use um, correlations to to estimate the sulfide content and it's key in terms of um, our capital and operating costs so certainly emphasize that uh, you know not in terms of sulfide sulfur rather than just uh, the throughput in terms of solids ton per day or the uh, annual uh, capacity in terms of ounces per annum other constraints need to be well understood such as uh, that are going to affect throughput such as all competency and, and feed density given that the autoclave circuit is, is volumetrically constrained, uh, variability is an issue, <clears throat> as well as the um, deportment of potentially deleterious elements and how they have to be handled both in terms of the uh, POC circuit and also in terms of tailings disposal. If these are um, poorly understood, uh, capex will be wasted. Uh, going further on that, uh, it, it's very important to understand key key relationships in terms of um, grade versus recovery. If there's a, a concentrator, where's the sweet spot? 
um, in terms of maximizing recovery and satisfying the um, uh, thermal requirements of the autoclave in terms of sulfide sulfur grade, um, the relationship between oxidation and, and gold extraction. Do we need a 99% um, uh, oxidation extent, for example, to, to give us the gold extraction we're looking for, as well as the, the normal variables that uh, control autoclave throughput. Uh, modeling is, or used intelligently, modeling is an incredibly powerful tool and uh, very cost effective relative to redesign or, or, or changing the design once the thing has been built. And I can't emphasize enough how um, used intelligently um, it, it should be used to explore the envelope before focusing on particular alternatives and even then um, be used to understand the particular constraints of the system and modeling itself can be processed in terms of using METSIM or, or um, JK SIMET uh, financial as well as physical for example using um, computational fluid dynamics for particular problems that, that wouldn't be typical but it's it's certainly something that we do do um, and then in overall terms, the alignment of, of, of the key process throughput constraints and mine design optimization will have probably the biggest effect on, on MPV um, once you take the, the mine costs and development into account. And I've listed some, some key um, constraints there which go to the uh, most capital intensive uh, portions of the design. Here's a, a brief example. Um, real world example from a preliminary optimization exercise and we can see the um, even with a revised mine plan that there was a, um, a, a, a significant variance between the uh, peak um, sulfur throughput in red and the, the average shown in black on the, uh, the chart on the, the line uh, the, uh, above. Um, and then this was modified to bring the um, working with the mining guys was were, uh, modified to um, significantly reduce that peak uh, by over uh, 35 percent and, and draw the peak much closer to the, the normal average saving a significant d degree of capex um, in the overall circuit. Um, Another key, key aspect is the management of risk. I mean, we have to understand it because uncertainty is a cost and we need to know the design margins, uh, whether they're obvious or, or, or not so obvious to ensure that we're, we're not over designing or in some cases under, under designing uh, this, that will lead to um, a disconnect between what we expect and, and what we achieve. And I think it's so important to, to have an agreed a balance of risk between the owner, uh, the proponent, the engineer who's designing and building the plant for you and the equipment suppliers. There will be an optimal balance of risk between all these parties and trying to push risk from one party to the other will result in a less than optimal outcome and, and waste capital. Because our goal here is to uh, achieve a cost effective fit for purpose design. In terms of operating time, uh, more time operating effectively means a, a smaller plant. In design, uh, we need to look at reducing uh, the circuit complexity, trying to make it inherently robust um, as much as we can do anyway. Um, ensuring that there's suitable upstream buffer capacity. Fortunately, typically downstream uh, leach circuits are, are quite forgiving and so therefore we only need to provide buffer capacity upstream. And a key lesson is not to under design the utilities and services for the autoclave circuit. Everything should be focused on ensuring the maximum possible uh, operating time for the autoclave circuit and minimal um, unintended uh, interruptions to that operating time. Um, in terms of operation, the considerations are very similar to safety, I'd suggest, um, with the addition of investing in, in maintenance planning as shutdowns are efficient shutdown uh, planning is, is critical to, to good operation and high operating time. Finally, uh, to wrap up some thoughts on, on key technical opportunities. Uh, I think that equipment size and reliability will just continue to improve. That's the, the nature of things. We've seen that from some of the examples I've, I've tried to show 
previously. <clears throat> Some key improvements, I think, particularly for pressure oxidation, will be uh, the development of improved inline instrumentation, allowing us to measure vent gas for oxygen and carbon dioxide and therefore improving oxygen utilization and autoclave control. And in a similar vein, uh, inline pH, if not, I don't think in autoclave pH, but certainly in, in discharge pH and, and ORP, because those are both quite challenging in terms of the temperature, uh, the acidity and the nature of the autoclave uh, discharge. And uh, finally, I'd suggest, I think we're going to see the further development of uh, expert systems where uh, models are being run in parallel using data from the operation from the DCS, uh, together with analytical data to mimic operation, uh, both to assist the operator in efficient operation, as well as keeping them away from areas of potentially unsafe operation. So with that, I thank you for the, uh, uh, your attendance and uh, I hope you've all learned something uh, from uh, today's presentation. Hello everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning for the Q&A uh, associated with the keynote presentation at our Gold Precious Metals sessions. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alan, who's uh, Alan Taylor, our conference chair, who's going to moderate the sessions. Over to you, Alan. Okay, thanks, Alison, and uh, thank you, Carol, for a terrific uh, presentation. I really enjoyed reading your paper and uh, learning something about about pox. I, I've always thought it's a bit of a, I, I don't particularly like the word, it's sort of, it's a bit negative, but, but anyway, that's where it is, it's pox, but, <laughs> but it's been anything but a pox on the gold industry, it's been a boon to the gold industry. So anyway, uh, I'm here to uh, ask to uh, see if there's any questions which you don't have at the moment. So uh, we've only got 10 minutes, so if you, you, you've got to hurry and get your questions in, otherwise I'm going to ask, ask them all and get my questions uh, asked, answered, hopefully. Okay, I'm going to read something, I'm going to read an announcement. Oh, we've got one. That's all right, I'll read this one. It's by Topi Barala, and he says, hello, Carol. Thank you for an interesting presentation. You mentioned that the treating of double refractory ores has become more successful. How do you see the improvements in the future regarding double refractory ore treatment? What could drive an improvement in downstream recovery, for example, in CIL? Oh, well, I think recoveries are still uh, are pretty good at the moment. Um, I think it's just better operating practices. There's a, perhaps a better understanding of the technology, so derived from the uh, original Newmont patent, uh, a better understanding of blanking of, of, of carbon and carbon management. Um, I think it's more, mostly down to practice. The technology is well understood now. Okay, next question is from Angela Duchesne. Carol. Please describe characteristics of good modeling and bad modeling of a FOX system, the POC system. <laughs> what an interesting question. Um, I think good modeling, uh, I mean, you, you, you have to say, what are you using the modeling for? Uh, is probably, probably a qualification. But in terms of what uh, I'm normally involved with, which is design, it's in terms of getting the mass and the heat balance right, um, as well as understanding the chemistry in terms of the acid balance. So uh, I think it has to be uh, pragmatic. It has to represent the heat balance well, uh, and it has to be able to be, it, it has to be a, sort of grounded in theory, but, um, uh, but improved by, practice and modeling and characterization with real circuits to, to um, uh, demonstrate that it actually does what it um, intends to do. Okay, thanks. Uh, next one's from Mike Dry. Uh, okay, uh, Mike Miller did an excellent paper a while back on thickness. He compared how we study mishaps in our game to how air the air transport industry does it. Carol, how would you compare us to the air guys? Well, I think it's a very good comparison and I'd agree completely because, and I 
and maybe a bit macabre, but I enjoy watching those uh, incident investigation reports and the sort of forensic nature of them is very similar to what's required uh, in our business. So I think there's a lot of similarity there in terms of when there is an incident, certainly working backwards and finding out what's going on, because as with um, aircraft investigations, it, it's the most obvious cause isn't necessarily the root cause. And it takes a, a fair bit of experience and also, I suppose, a good methodology to, to get to the bottom of the thing. So I think there are a lot of comparisons. Uh, sorry, it is a good comparison, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Ken Sato. He's asking for suggestions to increase mass throughput in pox, i.e. lower quench water for high sulfur feeds. Uh, well, I mean, you've got to satisfy the heat balance. I mean, there's obviously multiple things that you're doing at the same time, aren't you, Ken? So <clears throat> you, you can't just cut out the quench water. Obviously, increasing, I mean, uh, what are the constraints through the circuit? I mean, you, you've got to consider your residence time. Um, you've got to consider the oxidation kinetics that, that are required, both for the oxidation and for the hydrolysis of, of the iron or, or passivation of any arsenic, if, if that's what you're doing. Um, so are there, I think the question might be, are there alternatives to just adding quench water, for example? And uh, that might include things like flash recycle, if you have an existing circuit where you can uh, modify that and then reduce some of the heat load uh, by another means rather than just adding straight quench water. Uh, it's not clear to me whether you're talking about a, a new design or, or, or you're improving throughput through an existing design. I think you take potentially a slightly different approach with both, but whatever you do, you want to maximize the density um, on high sulfides. Obviously you have to be careful when the density gets too high because then you run into solubility issues and you get all sorts of in unintended consequences. So you need to be mindful of that. Okay, and as I get an opportunity to ask my one question from me. I know Clad made an, an announcement a few months ago and they said this, the unique operating conditions have driven designers and manufacturers uh, to use explosion, explosion welded titanium clad construction for the world's largest pressure oxidation gold autoclave for the expansion of polymethyl uh, and in, uh, at their uh, gold processing facility at Amersk in Eastern Russia. Uh, it's based on uh, Thai clad being considered to be more economical and reliable solution compared to, to brick. We've only got three minutes left. So could you give us, what's your view? Is this a special situation or is it a possible trendsetter breakthrough for titanium? Uh, it's a possible trendsetter uh, and, and, and uh, when you say breakthrough, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time, uh, almost, uh, al almost 20 years ago, after some scarring from uh, some poor experiences with the brickwork at Lahir, I, I gave a presentation at Randall on the same subject. However, that was before I was exposed to some of the difficulties we had with the uh, titanium linings in the West Australian laterites. So <clears throat> it, it's there are issues on either side. I think uh, brick lining has got a lot better, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, titanium cladding is a, is a serious contender. Um, I think I referred to in the presentation, well, maybe I cut it out, but the uh, uh, copper autoclave using the uh, Cecil process in 2008 for uh, CVID used a uh, solid, grade 12, as I recall, uh, Thai shell, and I understand that word well. So that, that's a solid shell as opposed to a Thai cladding. Um, let's see how the guys go with the new plant. I'm sure there'll be lessons to be learned because agitation intensity is significantly higher than in um, HPAL, which is the nearest comparison. So look, I, I think it's just a natural evolution and, um, there, but there, I, I expect there will be some, um, some challenges along the way. So let's see how they go. What about maintenance, things like where? Well, exactly. So, I mean, we have to see how that plays out. Uh, it'll depend on issues like scaling. If they're fortunate and they have enough scale to protect the, uh, the time, um, then it should likely be all right. Uh, there are other circumstances where that's not the case. And given the significant uh, power levels, 
there may be issues with uh, abrasion and wear. And then we know that repairing these metal line systems in situ is, is, is challenging. And once you start, you never quite get to the same place you were um, with a fresh clay. Yeah. Do you think it could result in an uh, increased on stream time? Yes. Yep. I mean, if they get it right and, and the system works for them, absolutely, because uh, brick lining, uh, if nothing else, every four to five years, you'll have to do a vapor phase um, or even a slurry phase, full course reline, which, depending on the size of the clays, can take you from, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of weeks to, to um, you know, three or four and uh, you have to feature that in it really depends how reliable the the the, the tie linings are in this particular service and and um, let's see how they go and getting getting it right and uh yeah. yeah i mean there's there's a lot of experience from other cloud vessels and uh the the hpal oh, experience has, has been very valuable as i've alluded to in the paper and, and in the presentation um so i wish them all the best and i hope it's successful Good. Well, we'll all be watching. Yeah, we will. Especially, especially people like Nova Clad and the Brick people. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, of course. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. We've got, we've got one minute to go, so I'd just like to uh, use that to thank uh, Carol for for uh, responding, being available to respond, and of course you can get his email from uh, from uh, uh, from the community, and you can send your uh, questions directly to him, and I'm sure he'd be glad to. Uh, uh, to answer them. Yep. So uh, that's all we've got. Thank you very much, Carol. No worries. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, well, we've uh, been having good fun so far. Thank, thank Back to you, Alison. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, time to head off to the next presentation. You'll have another chance to question Carol this uh, a bit later today with the panel. Thank you very much, Carol. Okay.